If the devil is not after you, he has you. That is the truth. Because as long as he's after you, it's a sign that he hasn't captured you yet. But if he isn't after you, it's a sign that he has already captured you. So just remember, as long as he's attacking you, you're a few steps ahead of him and keep on moving forward. There was a rich young man who came running to him and said, Good master, what could I do to have eternal life? And he told him, Keep the commandments. The young man said, I've done this since my youth. Or, what commandments? And he told him what they were. And he said, I've done this. He said, But one thing you lack. If you want to have eternal life, be perfect and sell all you've got and give it to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. Let's follow that young man just for a few moments before we enter the text to give a background. Now you see, that young man was asked to forsake all, but he refused to do it. And sometimes, if we apply prosperity and riches and so forth, success, but this young man was a successful young man and still didn't have eternal life. So sometimes, success doesn't always mean that God is blessing. But let's follow him. We find him here now in his youth, young, perhaps a handsome, well-dressed fellow. The Bible said, Jesus loved him. He must have a nice, good, tender conscience. He must be a very fine person, or he would never win the admiration of the Lord Jesus. Because when Jesus looked at him, he loved him. He must have had a kind expression and a nice look to him. A clean gentleman, straight cut boy. And he walked up to Jesus, perhaps thinking in sincerity and said, I would like to know what I could do to have eternal life. And when he had to part with what he had to have eternal life, then the question was at the gate where you can make it. And that question lies before every one of us. And Jesus really asked him to forsake all he had, take up his cross and follow him. And we know the story. He went away sorrowful because he had great riches. Then Jesus turned and said, how hard it would be for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Like a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But that would be impossible with man. But that would be impossible with man. But he said with God, it's not impossible. Let's follow this young ruler. The next time we find him in the Bible, he never, as soon as he rejected the opportunity to follow Jesus when it was laid down to him pretty stiff. You see, we want to hold on to everything that we can and then follow Jesus. Sometimes Jesus wants us to let go of everything so we can get both hands on him. Sometimes we think that just because we've got a hold, this rich young man, he would not give himself to Christ and so he went away. And we find him later that he had prospered so much until his barns were so full, until he said, so take thy rest. Oh, he had prospered, everything. He had so much, he had no need for anything. But something took place. The next time we saw him, he lifted up his eyes in hell, that he saw the beggar far off in the bosom of Abraham that was because he wasn't willing to forsake all to follow the Lord Jesus. Then, when this took place, and the young ruler would not give up what he had to follow, Jesus, it must have dawned on Peter. I believe it was him that made the remark or asked the question, raised it, and said, Now, we have forsaken all to follow you. We have forsaken all. Look what we have done. We left our homes. We left our families. We left our homes, we left our lands, we left everything that we had to follow you. It begins to dawn on him. Maybe he had been so carried away in the work, watching Christ and so forth, that he had never dawned on him that he had left his home. He had left his family. He had left his father, his mother. He had left all he had to follow Jesus. But that's exactly what God requires forsake all and follow him. That's God's requirement. We've got to do it too. Sometimes we've got to forsake even our thoughts 
If our thoughts about anything are contrary to God's word, we've got to forsake our own thinking and follow him. And the only way we can follow him is to follow him, is to follow his word, obey it. And God's request and God's requirement are that we forsake all and follow him. But in doing so, we find out sometimes we have to forsake our friends, many times. That's a hard thing to do, to forsake your old worldly life, your fashion, your trends. It's a hard thing because they'll call you old fashioned whenever you go to dressing like a Christian, acting like a Christian, living like a Christian, living like a Christian. They'll call you old fashioned, but you've got to forsake all to follow him. Jesus said, or the scripture says, he that loves the world or the things of the world, the love of God is not even in him, right? It takes forsaking all. When you are willing to forsake all and follow him, then if you abide in me and my word in you, you can ask what you will and it will be done for you. And this is how it should be. You must forsake your own ideas. You must align with his word and the Holy Ghost will never deny any word it has ever spoken. The Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. The Bible itself says so. And if the words of the Bible are God's words. In the beginning, the Word, the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now the Word is made spirit, dwelling in us. For I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world, the consummation. Now that same God who wrote the Bible is in you. You're not your own. You're dead to the things of the world. You're dead to your own thoughts. And let the mind that was in Christ, and let the mind that was in Christ be in you. There, there. Then you're forsaking all to follow him, not your own thoughts, but what he says not my will, but thine, Lord. Then you begin to align with God's word. But you may ask, what do I get then? Forsaking all, forsaking all. What do I get? You can expect the world to make fun of you. You can expect the world to call you all kinds of dishonorable names. They'll call you anything they can. You'll be despised and rejected. And this is how it should be. Jesus. Because of him being Emmanuel, God dwelling in him, it made him so different from his own church that his own church excommunicated him as soon as he came in. They were the ones who hung him on the cross. They were the ones who condemned him. He loved people. His whole heart was for people. But he had to forsake everything in order to follow God. And we also have to forsake everything in order to follow God. Now. What do I get in return? We don't expect anything in return. Sometimes I think we ministers make it a little too flowery for the convert. Oh, come to Christ. Everything is lovely. But you see, it isn't like that. It's not about everything being a flowery bed of ease. Because being a Christian, the Bible says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. So if you're not facing persecutions for the sake of Christ, then something is wrong. If the devil is not after you, he has you. That is the truth. Because as long as he's after you, it's a sign that he hasn't captured you yet. But if he isn't after you, it's a sign that he has already captured you. So just remember, as long as he's attacking you, you're a few steps ahead of him and keep on moving forward.